you will be told she is dead, given some cursory explanation. Heart stoppage, her comfortable old car T-boned on a dirt road. Her body sprawls in the imagination, undone, but there is no burden of proof. You will never see her again, but you will be her Facebook friend forever. It is cruel to unfriend the dead. Maybe it's the fog that's so heavy it brushes against my cheeks like animal breath. Or maybe it's the kaleidoscopic things the city does to dawn. Shadows wander like black ghosts. Buildings change color as I pass. Rhinestones trickle down dumpsters and twist up telephone poles to unimaginable heights. Or maybe it's the murals that paint themselves overnight. Graffiti imprints of sea creatures, of children, of doors, of mermaids, of lurid miniatures of this city. A city within a city, a Valparaiso for imagined, more vivid beings. Or maybe it's the rain that falls thick and heavy. I hear Chileans have several different words for rain, but none of them will tell me what any of these words are, just that they exist. So I continue to call rain Yubia, while old women shake their head as if the weather is too controversial for casual conversation. For whatever reason, today, as I walk to the bookstore where I work every day but Sundays, Valparaiso feels like a living thing. It morphs and shifts beneath my feet and feels foreign and strange. The city I was beginning to call home seems to reject me, dig me out, disown me. I used to repeat my own name out loud until its sounds became heavy and disjointed in my mouth, until it ceased to mean anything. Jeanette. Empty syllables, detach from me, detach from one another, a word in a very foreign language. I'd stare into the reflection of my eyes in my mother's vanity mirror until I felt separate from my body, painstakingly aware of each swoop and curve of its architecture. The girl who moved in the mirror looked like me, but she wasn't me. I thought of everything as God's deliberate premeditated blueprint everything carefully matched to something else. Me to my mother, my body to myself. I would sit in my mother's lap and list everything I noticed about her face. Every shade of green or gold in her big, deep set eyes. In the ravine, the girls stood with clenched fists like savages warming up to a stoning. Their breath came in short puffs on the cold evening air. They stayed hidden, one girl to a tree, smudges in the bruised, washed out light. I snuck behind my trusty oak and waited. When she finally appeared, tall and delicate in the floodlights, she had changed back into her school uniform. I could see the navy blazer and the short pleated skirt that looked so different on her than they did on me. Her long white legs shone out, beautiful, bare, an easy target. Around me I could feel a dozen eyes training themselves on her approaching figure. I thought of saying something, of calling out, warning her, but those legs... Now! They rushed her before she had a chance to speak, a pack of girl limbs flailing and flaying, scratching and scraping, day-glow fingernails screaming out against white skin, ripping at her hair, yanking at her backpack, and a part of my brain buzzing at me to go, go to her, go help her, but another part buzzing at me to stay. Stay and watch, wait and see. They've almost got it. They're wrestling her to the ground, pinioning her arms to her sides with the fury and zeal that only a Catholic schoolgirl can muster. Until at last, they wrenched the backpack from her shoulders and dropped it onto the ground. There, between the shoulder blades, sticking out of the Navy school blazer, were two crumpled wings. They stared, then one of them, impossible to see who, stuck out a fist and grabbed the first handful of feather. Soon all the girls were pulling and plucking. I heard her cry out, just once, and at that sound every nerve in my body sprang to attention. I ran out from behind the oak and blasted through the wall of limbs, saw her splayed out on the ground, half de-winged, 
hair a messy halo around her head, strings of blood still twisting out of tangles. I gathered her in my arms. She was light, shockingly light, and raced her out of the floodlights and away from the schoolyard. She returned as a stranger and begged for a meal. I cut an onion and heated the oil. When I offered her a plate, she had lost her appetite. Often she'd turn her head as if someone was approaching from a great distance. She complained of the cold and then of the heat. Her treasure was a small jar filled with her father's voice. She'd wake in the morning with seaweed in her hair and a vague memory of low tide. The distance between them was oceanic, she'd explained, which was why she spent so much time at the sea. She made films of herself wading into the ocean and studied the angle of her heart to her arms. She choreographed her entry into water to correspond with moonlight and the fine prow of memory. When she heard a girl call for her father, she rescued the word as if it had flown into a window to see her crouch and pick it up, soothe its eyes of terror and coax it back to flight. Once I saw her open her treasure jar and quickly dab her paintbrush into his voice. All her portraits when she was a girl had their hands behind their backs. She was no good at hands, she'd explain, so she hid them. What do you offer us? A soap bubble, a glass thread. What you place in our open hands, one branch of one snowflake, a sliver of smoke. And if and if the offering bursts, breaks, melts, if the smoke is swallowed in the night, we lift the barricades. We take the edges of our transients. We bury the ashes of our absences and sift the silences. Mm -hmm.